uh, thank you for the opportunity and the invitation to um, present to you guys today and just to share with uh, what I have been doing in my PhD up to this point and then uh, to give you guys a glimpse of what the science is, uh, what science is happening uh, in Victoria. Um, I do warn you, this is a fairly heavy science session, uh, so please interrupt me at any times. Uh, I won't be offended, just interrupt me, because even what I'm going through for the scientists it is very difficult to grasp as a concept, uh, even uh, to scientists. Um, are we okay with the audio? In which case, we'll keep on going. Yep. Um, Thank you. So the title of the talk is what is on the horizon of pancreatic cancer. So I'm not anticipating on discussing too much of the clinical details. I'm happy to discuss that at the end of the talk. Um, but I thought what might be more interesting is focusing on the science, which you guys wouldn't hear through your tra traditional oncology consultations. So I have no disclosures uh, for this talk. Um, pancreatic cancer, as you guys know, is that the incidence is rising in the blue line, and this is a reflection of an aging population. Even if we take into age into account, which is the orange line, the incidence is still increasing, and it's projected to uh, be the second leading cause of cancer death in Australia by 2030. And this is because of a we have increased prevalence of our risk factors such as obesity and diabetes, and we continue to have late detection of pancreatic cancer. And even when we do detect it, there's um, a, a high resistance to treatment. For the lucky few that are able to go for surgery upfront, there's unfortunately a high reoccurrence risk. And we don't have a biomarker that we can um, uh, detect uh, the reoccurrence of pancreatic cancer earlier uh, than before. And this is why the five-year overall survival remains poor at 14% compared to the lichen metastatic melanoma over the last five years. It has gone from something similar to uh, pancreatic cancer to now over uh, 50%. And this is why the government's recognizing that and uh, doing a national pancreatic cancer roadmap um, and the we are up to the initial consultation phase has completed and they're currently analyzing all the feedback from the stakeholders. Uh, this is actually a purple registry. So what purple registry is pancreatic cancer, understand routine practice, lifting the end results. It's an initiative uh, by Dr. Belinda Lee at WeHi, and it's another initiative supported by Pancare. And what you can see is that you have uh, two traditional class uh, combination chemotherapy that you would give to patients with metastatic pancreatic cancer, being for Fernox and gemcitabine and napaclitaxel. And what you can see is that um, in the clinical trials, for Fernox uh, demonstrate a much better uh, overall survival and much better improvement. However, um, in reality, um, this forms this. Uh, difference is not much difference at all. And what is important to note is that um, those that progress on their first line chemotherapy, only about 40% of people is able to get onto a second form of treatment or targeted treatment. And that's because 60% of people becomes really unwell. And this is why it's critical to get the first chemotherapy right. Then, what we're all interested in is in the era of precision oncology, we all talk about personalized medicine, finding actionable target, but unfortunately this only applies to less than 10% of people with pancreatic adenocarcinoma. And that's really because most of the pancreatic cancer is driven by KRAS mutations, um, where the biggest then, uh, subgroup is people with BRCA mutations. Um, what's unusual in BRCA mutation and pancreatic cancer is unlike the traditional BRCA where you have a lot of breast cancer and ovarian cancer, um, in the pancreatic cancer setting, often these families don't necessarily have the breast or ovarian cancer history, and they may present very late, which is counterintuitive um, because most people with uh, mutation that they inherit uh, down the their family, uh, they tend to present in the younger age group and not in the older age group. Unfortunately, as you can see, some of the new emerging therapies such as NRG1 fusion or KRAS-GTLC inhibitor, they are of all 
very low prevalence in pancreatic cancer. So whilst they are effective targeted therapy, it only applies to a minority of people. And if we were really um, uh, um, wealthy and money was no matter and we offered genetic testing for everyone on their cancer, it really only benefited about two and a half percent of people that we test. And that's a reflection because one, you've got to find the actionable mutation. One is very low. Two, you've got to be well enough. So remember, 60% don't get to second line. And, and three, you have to be able to access to these drugs. And often access can be a barrier. What is important is in the genetic front is that there is about 5 to 10% of you with pancreatic cancer will have mutations that you can pass on to the next generation. And I, I think that's important is if you, this is a study we did during my time in um, uh, Vancouver in Canada. And what we found in about 150 people is that of the people with mutation, only about half of them would have the traditional family history of you know breast cancer or pancreatic cancer or other cancer that suggests that we should test for um, a BRCA gene mutation or other familial genes whereas the other half of people actually don't have a history that would suggest um, uh, that you should test for uh, germline inheritance but you can see from little green man's is that you can find BRCA mutations which is a high highly significant, ATM is less relevant, but you have also mismatch repair proteins deficiency, which is uh, uh, important for immunotherapy. Those would be potentially missed. Um, and it's all about whether if we're able to deliver this testing at the first time when you meet the oncologist, that if we give you another test to do it later, either through telehealth, the uptake of testing significantly decreases. And so much so that um, in Australia, the EBQ, which is sort of our national guideline, they have recommended uh, for people to less than age of 60 uh, to be funded for uh, genetic testing in the family. However, I'm not sure why the consensus guideline is uh, stated this way, um, but this is the way uh, funding has occurred. But at least for the less than 60 year olds, um, it means that um, you could access these uh, gen genetic testing for free, whereas the older than succeeds, you'll have to pay about $600 to access this test. Um, but uh, this is something in the working progress. Then what do we look further, sort of what can we do to change this uh, terrible statistic associated with pancreatic cancer? As an oncologist, what I see is there are a group of patients where um, they tend to do better than other people with pancreatic cancer. The difficulty I have is I don't know who that person is from the outset. And so uh, scientists ha have uh, sequenced a lot of people with pancreatic cancer, and they have ways of classifying people into two different groups in this instance, what we call classical in the blue and basal in the um, orange. And you can see the basal group, they essentially do worse than the classical group. How they derive this is if you think they look at across a whole set of genes. And so they would say the orange genes represents if you have high expression of that gene, then that represents um, uh, you to be in the basal group. So what each row is, is the expression of the gene across uh, many different patients and each column is representing one patient and you can see the expression say even across this very top gene is quite heterogeneous there's some blue which meaning is low expression there's some high expressions but you can see even boxes there you could see that some people cluster in this high region group and that's how we call it it's basal and vice versa the other set that's high expression we call it classical but then you see the third group where they have a mixed response. And in reality is these group of people, which makes up about 12% of the uh, people, they actually got a mix of both type of cells. And so their survival is actually somewhere in the middle of the blue and orange line. Um, but of course, it's very really difficult to classify them into either of these groups when you're doing a clinical study. So it makes it very difficult to incorporate because you can't definitively say you're part of this group or you're part of this group. And this is also comes back to the fact we look at the relative expression of the gene. So, you know, if in the cohort, 
um, you have people with expression of this gene at at a value of 10, and then you have another person with high value at 20. That's a two-fold increase. But equally, you could have a cohort of patient with expression value of one, and then expression value of two. That's again a two-fold increase, and that will come out as red. So you can see, even though they're tenfold difference, they're still relative, that in terms of relativity, they're exactly the same. So it's difficult. This is where sort of this problem of relativity makes it less reproducible as to whether if we can classify a patient that we're sitting, that we have in front of me into one group or the, the other. And up until this point, um, we haven't worried about this subtyping as much because it only separate people into who's going to do better and who's going to do worse. But that is no help to you and I if there's nothing we can do about it. Research is now just emerging, suggesting there's two molecular subtypes. There is a slight therapy difference in terms of the response that we see. So this is a fairly complicated concept, but if you, the takeaway point is to say, there are ways we can tell uh, people for, who are going to do well and who are not going to do well, but it's not a reliable method. But now it's emerging that we may be important uh, to tell the difference because it may you may show different responses to the treatment we give you, but that's all very um, early in the piece. Then people have done uh, studies in terms of drivers of pancreatic cancer, and this work is actually out of the Australian Pancreatic Genomic Initiative, which was done in Australia about 10 years ago. And in fact, we were world leading uh, in terms of providing the sequencing information. And what you see is, sorry, is that there's about 10 drivers that drives a pancreatic cancer to grow. What we always think about is this KRAS because 90% of pancreatic cancer have this mutation, but there are other mutations that is relevant. We know there's something in the RNA processing domain, but we've never been able to target it. So what's RNA processing? What it is, is your DNA is your blueprint or to build your house or build your protein in this matter. And so you can make a copy of that DNA, what we call the pre-mRNA. It's contained region we call exons. So what exon is, is the protein coding region. So they translate into the, uh, the protein that we need. And there's introns in between these exons. And then we need to first chop them out and then bind the exons together to form the actual blueprint. Now, why exactly do we have these introns? Uh, that's a subject for another day. But essentially, you uh, what I want you to take away is that there's a process of this chopping out and that we call splicing. And it requires basically assembly of other proteins to, to do the chopping. And uh, PRMT5 is a, a protein that methylates these small proteins to be able to assemble together properly. I'll tell you what methylation is in a uh, second, but if you just think we need this en enzyme to um, allow these uh, scissor and cutting to happen normally. So if we impact on PRMT5, then the cutting may be impacted and we may have a different building uh, blueprint in terms of what protein we get. And why is that important? And that's because we recognize there's mutation in P53 in pancreatic cancer, and indirectly, it affects the cutting of this GAP17 protein. So why is that important? So normally, we talk about KRAS mutation, it drives the cancer to grow. Normally, GAP17 associate with this RAS protein and stops this some of the signaling, so it's not a continuous growth stimulus. But when you have a defective cutting up of the blueprint, you generate a defective protein where it doesn't associate with RAS. So you get sustained activation of for the cancer to grow. And this is how P53 mutant pancreatic cancer ends up being more aggressive uh, than your P53 wild type. From there, we also then learned that if you are a P53 wild type in the blue dotted line, and we give you an inhibitor, SF3B1, which impacts on the cutting, we can improve the survival of the mice with pancreatic cancer. However, if we give a P53 mutant, 
which relies on this abnormal process to drive cancer growth, and we give an inhibitor to this process, you get a much more significant uh, improvement in survival of the mice, suggesting the cancer can become dependent on these what we call alternative splicing or different blueprint um, that we have of a special protein. And then because of this dependency, we can exploit it and um, inhibit it and lead to better survival uh, in patients with pancreatic, well, in mice with pancreatic cancer. So if you think that science was a little bit heavy, I'll do this in a cartoon form that I uh, contracted my three and a half year old daughter to do. So if you think of one protein, any protein you like to think about. So in actual fact, we think of our body makes one protein and it's only one protein only. In actual fact, it makes different copies represented by four little people in the middle we have. What pancreatic cancer has done in the mutant P53 is figure out the right combination so that it becomes able to grow into the big bully in the schoolyard. What we then like to do is use a PRMT5 inhibitor, which stops pancreatic cancer's ability to select for this dominant um, protein that allows it to grow better so that there's more of you surviving in the long term. That's the idea. So, okay. So now that you had a break, um, are we clear up to this point? Just giving you guys a chance to catch up because it sort of goes on uh, from here. So just want to make sure you, I'm, I haven't lost anyone along the way. <clears throat> well, yes, you have. OK. So I think the main thing is to say is that um, we make different versions of a protein, and that protein because of a different version, it might give us a more selective advantage. So analogy I use here is another analogy I say, look, we'll all drive a car, but we can drive a Ferrari, which will go faster. This is if we drive, you know, a Golf Mini, which goes a little bit slower. And so Kansas figured a way out to make it so that it's driving a Ferrari all the time and it's dependent on this Ferrari. But if we are able to tackle this and stop it from making more of the Ferrari, then we can stop the cancer from growing. That's essentially the first part of the message. OK. Does that make sense, Chris, or not really? <laughs> it's a lot of science heavy. So, yeah. Yes, can uh, hear you clear. I was a bit late getting getting onto your program. I'm sorry about that. My apologies. Um, <clears throat> yes, I'm a little bit confused because I'm not 100% not sure um, how, and I'm sure we, other people are feeling the same. It's about applying all this, all these alternatives to yourself, and and um, seeing where you go from here. That's that's the issue. Yeah. So I think. Yeah. yeah. I think the application, direct application to yourself is low in this instance, uh, because what you're trying, what I'm trying to show here is very basic science understanding of how cancers come about and what processes cancer has adopted along the way to allow it to grow a much faster rate than your normal cells. Um, right. <laughs> and this, this is, what I'm talking about here is only one of the way pancreatic cancer is able to outsmart your cells and allow it to grow um, much more proficiently than your normal cells. And this is why it's turned cancer. And what can we do to target this? This is something what I'm talking about is something that's previously never been targeted. And we're looking to target a whole new process because the current tools that we have in terms of chemotherapy, it doesn't work very well. And of some small population of pancreatic cancer patients, we do have targeted therapy available, but um, it's very low. Uh, it only applies to a small number of patients uh, that is gonna be helpful. Um, so we're looking for new things so that we can find more therapy that applies to more of you. The interesting bit here is the P53 mutations 
Now, you're not going to notice unless you sequence your cancer, um, but about it applies to about 60 to 80 percent of you will have this mutation as part of your pancreatic cancer. So if this turns out to be an effective therapy, then it will apply to you in this way. But currently is in very early development phase, and that's what I'm talking to you about. And that's why I'm trying to develop essentially a new therapy for pancreatic cancer. Right. So where is this being done at the moment in Melbourne? Uh, it's currently being done at Peter Mac uh, okay. in the laboratories. Yeah. So if you want to explore that process, does, do I need to get in touch with Peter Mac? <coughs> so this, this is very much early in the laboratory research. It's not yet clinical trials yet. Okay. So they have tested this drug in other cancer and shown that it's safe. But um, I'll get to the next point, which is, in essence, is I'll get to it in a second. But to answer your question, I'll jump ahead. Um, is that they've done phase one clinical trials. So what phase one clinical trials is, is looking at safety of this. So what they look at in the marker is something, a process this PRMT5 does, or protein arginine methyl transferase, is significantly reduced between after 14 days of taking this drug and we look at the type of uh, methylation it does it definitely inhibits it very well going from brown to essentially no brown so that's very good but what we see in terms of effect in patients now this is none this is not in pancreatic cancer this is in bladder cancer breast cancer head and neck cancer what you want to see how you read this is each bar represents a patient um, if it's going up, it means the cancer is growing. If it's going down, it means the cancer is shrinking. We as oncologists draw an artificial line at 30%. If it's shrunk down more than 30%, then it's shrinking the disease. You can see this drug doesn't work very well. It's only a, essentially three or four patients that it works in, but I would argue that's a problem of patient selection. So they're selecting based on the target being hit well, but biologically, we don't understand how well this drug, how this drug truly works. And this is why it's still in development. Right. OK. OK. So just to go back a little bit in the talk is to say what methylation is. So what this protein does is it binds to arginine. So arginine is one of 21 amino acids that we have in our body. and repeats of various combination of these 21 amino acids makes up all the protein in our body. It recognizes one of those 21 uh, amino acids, and what it does is take a methyl group uh, and then attach it to the, its molecule, and this is what we call step one. Step two is what PRMT5 does, and then adds another methyl molecule, takes another one of these proteins and add it to another bit. So it's a bit of chemistry for you. And this is what we call symmetrical dimethyl arginine, SDMA for sure. Or the other process is PRMT1, which does it asymmetrically. What is the consequence of doing this? It's all dependent on where this process is happening. And this is where the co-binding factor, so in this case, the MET50, it determines where this PRMT5 is going to work because it can work in a lot of different places. Um, so just to take you through a, a bit of, again, bio, bio, biology is you have your DNA, you have your gene. It's normally wrapped up in what we call a double-stranded DNA, so it's not open. you got to first open up your gene so that you can copy it into a transcript that we call a pre-mRNA, then we got to chop up the, the, the bit in the middle where it's not coding a protein and form a proper uh, blueprint. That gets in outside, in, still in the cell, and then that gets um, progressively is the blueprint that tells the cells how to attach the 21 amino acid into a combination to form a protein on your cell or wherever that protein is happening. And the protein over time, uh, gets targeted and gets broken down. That's a normal cycle of expression of a gene into a protein and then its eventual breakdown. The difficulty with this particular target is that at every single step that I've just talked about, PRMT5 has some action along every single step. 
So you can imagine it's not it's very difficult to tell what is it doing because it could be doing step one in this cell, step two in another cell, step six in, in another cell, et cetera, et cetera. So this is uh, the difficulty, and I guess this is why we don't see a very good response from this drug initially. But what we do see, similar to the division that we talked about, is that people with low expression, low level of this PRMT5 uh, do be, survive longer, and people with high PRMT5 do worse. And similarly, in patient cohort, it's reproducing the same results. Then this is the next concept I'm going to confuse you all with. Um, so if you bear with me, there are four different type of cell lines here. So these four different names. What the bar represents is remember what, what we talked about in terms of uh, this um, uh, chopping, chopping up the transcript into different versions of the protein. So if you use this drug across these four cell lines, you can see that in this particular cell line, and it causes a lot of changes in a lot of different genes, over 6,000, in fact. And yet across this cell line, you only have about 3,000 events, changes across 3,000 genes. Then we look at another factor we call IC50. What that means is in these red dots here, is that what is the concentration of the drug I need to inhibit the cell's growth by 50%? And, and what you can see the relationship is if you if PRMT1 or PRMT5 is able to cause lots of changes in a gene when we give the drug, it seems to be very sensitive for cell lines that, you know, it change minimal amount of genes relative to the speaking. It becomes fairly resistant because I have to give much bigger doses of the drug to achieve the same effect. So what this diagram is trying to tell me, tell you is that um, there may be an effect of how this drug works is causing the splicing that we talked about here is how, how is uh, the blueprint being made up or change is very important to the process. So step number three is very important to the process of how it works. And we can see that if we give PRMT5 inhibitor to, to some cells, it causes about 1,400 events. Um, and same thing, PRMT1 causes 1,400 events on its own. However, when you give it as a combination, it works better at killing pancreatic cancer cells. But what it does is it creates 2,400 events that were unique when uh, or new compared to if you either give the either agents alone, suggesting is it a better cooperation on inhibiting these 219 targets, or is it one of these 2,400 new events or new target that they're hitting that's causing the better killing effect? So scientists, the way to figure that out is to try and put, say, well, out of these 3,700 genes that's being affected, where, where, what do, do these 3,700 genes do? And they look at it and they all, look at it and they go, it's all to do with mRNA, so that's a blueprint we're talking about, splicing, processing, and all to do with splicing. is. So this is sort of the preliminary evidence that we have to suggest PRMT5 works by this fashion. So this brings it on to my PhD is to try and find out this process and see if we can exploit this to translate this into a new therapy for you to target pancreatic cancer. So I will get on to the second part of the talk, which is looking at drug development approaches. So traditionally, we first scale, scale the literature and see what we understand about this drug. Then traditionally, we, we, we're science is a deductionist approach. So you change one aspect. So, you know, you like growing a plant, do I water it more? Is that going to make the plant grow quicker? So I, I would do the experiment where I water the plant on one side and I don't water it on the other side and measure the growth rate. And you got to wait time and then you go, OK, maybe it's not watering, it's sunlight. But in reality, we know it's, it's a combination of watering and sunlight and we have to get it right. But doing it sequentially, it, it allows us to measure the effect of our intervention. And that's sort of the deductionist approach of typical scientists. 
But nowadays, people have gotten a bit clever because doing one gene at a time is very difficult. In your human body, there's about 20,000 genes. We would be here till the cows come home if we were taking it one by one for 20,000 times. So we have now technology to do the whole thing all at once and to see which one are important to the response of uh, PRMT5. We have other ways of looking at the effect of the drug. And then, of course, we go back to the simple deductionist point of view. Uh, once, you know, genes that we think are important, we then got to validate it. So if we scale the literature, this is three different, just in pancreatic cancer from the literature, they are suggesting there are three different ways. One is through GSK3B, one is through FBXW7, and one is through this uh, process MDM4 to P53 in across a, a range of cancer. So this this relationship of high PRMT5 does worse is true across breast cancer, uh, stomach cancer, bladder cancer, liver cancer, blood cancers. So a lot of these processes still apply, but which of these three processes are more important? This is what we need to try and find out. So this is, you know, simple techniques. You know, we this plus here is we knock out this PRMT5 here, we knock it out. And what we see is we get less activation, what we call phosphorylation of EGFR. So what you're seeing is the darker bit goes lighter. And then downstream of that, you look at AKT, darker bit goes lighter, so less of that. Same thing, GSK3B, darker goes lighter, so less. So if we knock out PRMT5, we reduce this, we reduce this, we reduce this, and ultimately we reduce beta catenin. And how does this then lead on to less cancer? Maybe it's through this gene C MIC, which typically drive cancer growth. That's sort of the traditional approach. And then we just got to go back and investigate, you know, is it the GSK3B is more important or is it beta catenin is more important? And we just got to do this plot every time. This takes a while to do, you know, a couple of days just to generate this thing. And for the, and depending on the drug it takes, it's a slow, arduous process. So this is the genome screen we do. So assuming we have a pancreatic cancer, that there's a mixed population of cancer, we give it dose with the drug. And then we apply our technology is that so that in each of these cells, I can just knock out one gene at a time, just in one of these cells. And then I grow it under PRMT5. Now, say this green gene that we knocked out in here is important for PRMT5 to work. So if I knock out that gene, it means PRMT5 is not going to work. So therefore, unlike the other cells, I'm going to grow much faster because PRMT5 is having no effect on me. And so what I look for at this point with time is to say, what are the genes that are knocked out that allows it to what we call gain of representation, that you have more of these cells to, to work out in retrospect what's important for PRMT5 to work. We can also look at what cells are lost early on in the piece, because then we figure it must be working with PRMT5 together to kill off the cell much quicker when other cells haven't died. So it's one way of looking at cells that on a whole gene level, so 20,000 genes all at once, which are the important one for its for the drug to work, which are the one that works well with the drug to kill off the cancer. So that's, you know, novel things we can do. Then we can look at, you know, uh, PRMT5 is a funny drug in that if I leave it on for one day or two days or three days, the effect of it, it changes versus six days. Um, so we can look if we just dose it with a sugar pill, if you like, in, in the lab, we call it DMSO, or the actual drug, in this case, uh, on PRMT5 inhibitor is GSK595. Um, and we can compare the two and see what changes there are in terms of the genes that we do. Um, and one way to look at it is to say, uh, look across all your samples. So I've done four replicates. So there are four treatments up here, four, con uh, sorry, four controls. So they're, they're treated with sugar pills. 
and these four are treated with um, the drug. And then over time, what you see in the blue is they become the their, their gene, all their gene expression goes down, and then the control goes the opposite direction. And so by comparing and contrast, then we look at what genes are different between the two groups to again try to infer what are the important ways of this drug working, given we don't know exactly how it works. So then what we do is we look at across all the genes that's being affected, are they involved in certain biological processes? So things like hypoxia, meaning low oxygen, are they involved in mitotic spindle, which is cell needs to go into cell cycle. I won't go into the details of this, but you get a list of many sort of biological processes. It's hard to know what to do with that. So then what, what I do is I then take day one, day two, day three, day six, and add it all up and see which pathway is consistently being hit. And this is what I have for you highlighted in yellow, is that across time, these pathways are important and they all involve genes that's consistently seen across the mix. And that's one way of going from a big list like this down to five little lists. And then I can look at specific gene sets, say MIC, and then I compare the two, and then I end up with four, you know, going from uh, 196 and the 58 genes, you know, overall it would be, you know, 250 genes. Then I can look at the concordance and figure out, okay, out of the 250, maybe it's these four that's important. Then once I figure that out, then this is where I go back to the traditional approach and say, okay, of those four, is it the AKT that's important? That's confirmed that I will inhibit it and see if that, that stops PRMT5 from working or not. And that's sort of scientifically how you test this out. Um, and then you can look at across different gene sets. So people have worked up what uh, genes belong to each grouping and people define groups. And we look at what this grouping represents. They represent cell cycle, metabolism, so like, you know, how you process your cholesterol and your sugar, how you process your RNA, so those blueprint we talked about. Cell cycle is for cells to grow. They need to sort of replicate itself. Uh, extracellular matrix is what sticks, allow cells to stick to each other. And so you look at across different gene sets. So all I want you to take away is what the color coding is, is cell cycle, it's green is the predominant. And again, different gene set, green is predominant. So that suggests, so, so through this all sort of correlative analysis, this is how you work from a whole genome level down to a biological process that you want to focus on and try and validate. And this is the same. What else can you do on a whole genome level from a science point of view is you can say, OK, so these you're not expected to read what the genes are because they all jumbled up. But of all these genes that are important, that you think are important, what happens to them? So on the right, what we have is the treated, sam uh, uh, treated samples. And then on the left, we have the control. So what I have. It, it's easier to see in the control. You see these four samples that day one, day two, day three, day six. So in this particular panel, if you're judging by color, you could say these genes are gradually being turned on over time as the cancer grows without any drug. It's just a normal growth. And yet, if you compare to the treated, they're not being turned on as much as the control. So maybe PRMT5 is doing something to these gene sets where the cell, as they grow, they get turned on certain genes, but PRMT5 stops it from doing so, and maybe that's how it kills them. Or is it this gene set where across control, nothing really happens, but as you hit from day one to day six, it really gets turned on and maybe it's these genes that are critical to the response. So these are sort of looking across using the whole genome and whole lots of all the genes at once. You can then cluster around these genes and from these cluster genes from experience that tells us they will be in process that's related. 
but how they are related, this is the subject of further analysis at this point in my PhD. Um, but this is the next bit. Once we come up with that gene list, which I have, we need to figure out how they relate to each other to explain how PRMT5 works. And again, you know, other ways of validating it. I've looked at one cell line. Can you reproduce it in another cell line? Um, so this is what I've done in the interim. You go through the same process. And all what, what we're looking for is we're looking at transcription, which is we're assuming the proteins are being, uh, the genes are being turned on and made into trans blueprints. And therefore we're inferring what's happening on the protein level to be the same as this. But we know as from my diagram, it could be any of this process along the way that will change so it's not a one to one result. It may be one to 10 results or 10 to one results. So we're making a lot of assumption in the analysis that I've shown you. So one way to deal around this is then we look at other pathways because if this is being made into uh, copies, your, your DNA must be open so that you can copy it. If it's boundly tightly closed, surely you're, you're not able to copy it. And that's just the normal mechanics of DNA and RNA. And so we can do something called attack sequencing. It's just big words to figure out which part of your DNA is open. And what you want to see is this open part correlates with increased uh, numbers of the transcription. And then that would be one way of validating your answer as well. Or you could be looking at other process when I alluded to how splicing, you know, making a different versions of the same protein is important. And it's a balance of the proportion of the versions that you got is important. Then we can correlate the, all three of them to try and give us some confidence how PRMT5 works when, you know, it could be any of these seven steps that it has action in. And so it just gives us a bit more confidence. Ideally, sure, we could do all seven steps and correlate it all together to get the greatest confidence. Um, but to give you a concept, you know, you think, oh, this is easy. Analysis in the number seven space, that could be someone's PhD, which is three or four years work right there. So it's it, it's a lot of times science moves very slowly because it actually takes a lot of time uh, to do these things. But really what I'm hoping to do is develop this PRMT5. What I haven't talked about is PRMT5 targets cell cycle, DNA repair, all these other pathways. So out of the 10 pathways that we think about are drivers of pancreatic cancer growth, it hits about seven out of 10, which is phenomenal. And really what we're looking at, we haven't ever been able to target RNA processing. And so if I was able to really delve into how this actually works, then we could develop a whole new class of therapy for pancreatic cancer and potentially a whole new class of therapy for other cancer, just like how you guys will learn immunotherapy really changed the landscape of treatment of um, cancer overall. And hopefully that means there's a new hope for um, all of us who are affected by pancreatic cancer. And I put this picture up because what I want to do is, and, and this is why I in to do this PhD, is really I want to say more of you that my traditional chemotherapy unable to do. And so we need to find something so that we're able to keep you around so that you can enjoy the simple things in life that you want to enjoy. And I guess this is sort of brings me to my close of my talk. It really, this is a science story up to this point and got to thank RICP and Pancare um, for providing the funding for me to be able to continue this work.